hope you've been having a great Rupercon. Um, we're going to talk about bones and bones black and how to deal with mold lines and get paint on them and the, the great primer debate. Um, so I hope I hope that you enjoy this. Um, I'd ask all the people in chat, actually, I do have a chat window up and I'm going to try to look for questions, but I suspect there are, are a lot of people and it's going to be hard for me to follow uh, all of the questions. So I'm kind of going to go through things in uh, various categories. So if you can try and keep your questions to about the category that I'm talking about, and I will try to stop and uh, check for questions periodically. But also, if you could help me out with um, people who come in a bit late to the stream. So let them know that this is going to be recorded and it will be available here on Reaper's Twitch channel and then in a few days or a week or so, I'm sure that they'll put it up on the uh, Reaper YouTube site as well. So if people come in and they're asking about topics that are already discussed, I'll either try to get back to that at the end or they're just going to have to watch the, the restream. Uh, there's also a document. Let me just switch views for you. Yeah, we'll do that one. So let's give you a little bit of both. So there's a document that goes along with this. If you go to this website, right at the top of the page, and I'll keep it at the top of the page for a couple of weeks at least, it'll stay up forever, but just to make the, the link really easy to find right now, uh, it's going to have all of the brand names of the products I mentioned, a uh, brief description of the techniques that I'm suggesting you use. So don't feel like you have to write everything down or if, you know, two weeks from now you're like, oh, I'm trying to do a wash right on bones and I don't remember how to do that. You'll be able to come get this PDF and have a reference. So you can also let, I'll, I'll mention this a few more times throughout the stream, but uh, that's another thing if you could help me out by letting people know about that. I'm pretty new to all of this uh, video stuff. I've been trying to practice for the past couple of weeks and, and uh, get a little smoother at it. but. It's still is a lot of things happening at the same time to keep track of, and I want to make sure what I focus on is getting you the information that you need. So this is a printout of the handout that I'm talking about. So I'm going to reference that a little bit. So where this comes from, uh, when Bones Miniatures first came out, there were a lot of debates about, actually, I think it's a little more fo focus up here. Uh, when Bones Miniatures first released, there were a lot of debates about, can you do this, can you do that, what works, what should I use for, I want to do this. Uh, so I got a bunch of them and I tested various products and, and techniques and I posted uh, FAQ posts on the Reaper forums. So what I'm giving you here in this discussion are the best, the things that I found that I had the most success with. If you want to see everything I tried, you want to see pictures of, you know, I tried various things to take off mold lines and you want to see the pictures of what that looked like to make your own judgments about my, what might work or you have products that you're wondering, was that something I tested and I didn't mention because it didn't work that well. The, the document that you can download has links to those forum pages and there's also a lot of replies from people. I mean, those have been up for, I don't know, five years or something now. So there are a lot of replies from other people sharing their experiences and the products that they've used. So if you only know me as more of a, I paint some of the, the models for the Reaper website, I'll do the Christmas miniatures or some of the Sophies. If you think of me as a display painter, you may be wondering, well, why is she talking to me about bones? She doesn't paint miniatures for gaming. And I don't paint a ton, but I definitely have painted them. Uh, so I'm going to show you a selection here. And then at, towards the end, I'm going to talk about good ways to store your bones figures. And um, I'll show off more of the figures that we've used in our game. So some of these have, were painted for games. Some of them were painted for practice. As a display painter, what I love about bones is they're just ready to go. So if I want to test something out, if I want to practice something I saw in someone else's tutorial, um, they're, they're there, they're, it's easy. I don't have to prime and prep and do all this stuff. And that, in fact, is what this one is. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with James Wapple, and that this was when he first did his painting pyramid videos. I got a few of those, and this was me using a bones figure to practice that. Um, the bones black are a bit newer, and I hadn't painted a lot of those, so I painted this figure to test that out. And this is something I painted because I wanted to promote the quad color challenge. The entries have ended now, but you should definitely go look at them in the folder on the Discord. It, there's some really interesting things, what people can do with just four colors of paint. 
This is me practicing following a workshop that I took. Uh, this is me practicing using the airbrush. So bones are good for more than just figures that you want to throw on the game table, but they're absolutely fantastic for figures that you want to throw on the game table. So I will just put these aside for now. We may return to them later. Um, it, it's possible we have some people here who maybe Bone 5 is the first time you ever heard of bones, or maybe you haven't gotten any at all and you're not sure what they are. So I just kind of want to talk about the, the different generations of bones. This is one of the original uh, white bones figures. It was originally released in white material, and if you've supported or bought bones from the beginning, even now you'll still get white bones from the store. And as you can see, they're very um, rubbery. And that's what makes them great, because they're so light and they're so flexible, you can drop them, you can twist them, you can kind of abuse them, and, and they the, like what they used to say about Timex watches, they take a licking and they keep on ticking. They've now started to produce more of the bones. So this this is still the original formulation, the very bendy kind. They've switched over to, to more of this light gray. As you can see here on my camera, it's a lot easier to see. It's easier to photograph. Uh, many people find this a little too bright when they want to paint. They can't see where the details are. So for a variety of reasons, they've switched to this gray. And uh, I like the change, I think it's good. But now we have something called Bones Black. So the complaint with these, and I didn't, I have some figures that we'll talk about in a minute, but I'll get them out now too. The complaint with the original Bones is you would have things like this happen, where this is supposed to be a nice straight weapon shaft and it is clearly very much not. Uh, and that's not necessarily a great look. So Bones Black is meant to be a compromise in the the features that you get between the bones and the bones black. What happens here is this is a stiffer material, but that also means it's less durable. So I could, without very much trouble, bend this back and forth enough to break this off, where it would take a lot more bending before this actually broke off. So that's your trade-off. You get uh, you know sharper edges for some kinds of detail and things of that nature, you get straighter swords and, and weapon halves. But you do need to take just a little more care with them than you do with these, which people, I believe in the testing phase, Reaper literally drove cars over them. And, and I've had people, when we were at cons and we were first promoting the bones for the, the very first Kickstarter, we would throw them on the ground and tell people to, to stomp their feet on them. And there was one little cobalt by the end of four days that broke, one of his ankles broke. And that was the only damage to miniatures that we were having people do that over and over again suffered. So that's what the, the, the bones and the bones black, that's why there's two, that's why there's different colors. Um, they're all PVC vinyl miniatures. Just uh, there's slight differences in the formulation or slight differences in the color. So this is a problem that a lot of people suffer with bones, is this bendiness. Um, and I'm trying to think, I think I can mute. So the, the one, the, the easiest solution for this, particularly these smaller pieces, is if you get a hair dryer on high, often you can just apply the heat and it'll start going back into the position it's supposed to be without you even doing anything. Sometimes if it's really been, like I had these guys thrown in a, in a plastic bag and they were all mushed together, so that's been held down that way for a while. I may need to take this and kind of, after it's heated, hold it, even hold it a little past true, and then it should kind of go back to the position that it's supposed to be. It's a memory plastic. Um, I think given that this is uh, Twitch and people are going to worry if they don't hear anything, I'm not actually going to demonstrate this on screen, uh, or maybe I'll do it at the end. But the the hair dryer is all you need for these smaller pieces. If you're we working with the larger terrain pieces, like some of the, the castle parts that came with the dragons, things that have the big fat bases, a better technique for those is you're going to need to boil water, put the piece in. You need to not let it touch the the pan sides too much because that could melt it. The boiling water isn't going to melt it, but if you touch it to like a piece of metal pan that's been heated to boiling, that could damage the material and then plunge it into a pool of ice water that will 
help it go back to its true shape that it's supposed to take. If you continue having problems, my recommendation would be to go onto the Reaper forums, which again, there's going to be a link to that in your handout uh, that you can download. I'll put that back up for anyone who's late. Go here and just look for the first sentence on the page after the header bar and you find a link to download the handout that explains most of the stuff. And there's links to the Reaper forums. And, or you can go on the Facebook or the Discord and ask other people. I, I'm going to be honest, I don't work with the big pieces a lot personally, so I haven't done this a whole bunch myself. I normally just use a hairdryer. Uh, if you have a heat gun, you can use that on a lower setting. Um, but you can fix the problem. The one thing to note about the heat is if you're familiar with resin miniatures, you may have used heat to alter the positioning. So you may have been able to use heat to like move this guy's arm down a little bit so that you slightly change and customize the position of the figure. That will not work with bones. It may seem like it work, works, but as I mentioned, bones is a memory plastic. So the next time that miniature gets hot, you leave it in your car or you go get lunch uh, after your game or you know you put it on the windowsill or something like that it gets warm again there's every chance that that piece is going to kind of back right to the factory intended position if you want to permanently alter the position of a bones miniature you need to cut the piece and glue it back in the position that you want and we're going to talk about how to do that too uh, because that's one of the other things that's fun about bones is that's super easy to do um it, when I, I did this class in in uh, the Zoom format on Thursday, and someone there had mentioned that they had some problems with things losing shape, and there were some of the earlier ones, the big dragons, the that are heavier, they start to droop, some of them, and with every iteration, Reaper learns more about the things that don't work or the things that work well, and they improve it. So now they make sure that the heavy pieces like that have at least three points of um, attachment to the bases so that they have more of a support structure. They alter the, the mix of the plastic where necessary. But some of those big pieces, the problem isn't that the, the material is bending. The problem is that it's, well, it's bending, but it's bending under the pressure of gravity. It's, it's less of a, you can fix it with heat problem. You may need to add a pin or add a support structure under a tail or something like that. So hopefully that uh, addresses the reshaping issue. Yeah, I actually should have, I meant to uh, have like a thermos of hot water and do it that way to show you without making the noise, but um, then I forgot I had that plan. So now I'm, I meant to do this at the beginning too. I'm going to do this on screen. So I have a number of these snakes here. So this one, uh, oh, and I've frozen for just a minute. Hopefully the screen will unfreeze. Let me try switching and see if that helps. So can you guys confirm in chat whether the close-up screen is frozen or not? Yeah, if, if you're not seeing my hand wave in front of it, then it's frozen. Okay. Okay, let me... I don't have a cogwheel. I have an eyeball or a lock. Up at... Oh, okay. Yes, I see it now. All right, let me try. This is... Well, of course it would do this. Yes. Um, yes, and this is the problem that I had before that it didn't take. But let's let's give it a shot. So is it working again? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, apologies for that. Uh, so this one has an S on... Hmm? Okay, 
Thank you. I'm talking to Justin. If, if you guys, if it sounds like I'm nuts, I'm talking to Justin in my ear. Uh, so this one has an S written on it because I washed him with soap and water. Again, I couldn't really easily do that on camera. Uh, but I'm opening these guys straight out of the blister so that you can see there's no flim flammery. Although now I lost my Sharpie. Well, we'll use the crappy other Sharpie. So, it's like a magic show, only it's not really mine. Oh, nope, there's the good Sharpie. And I'm going to keep this for a later stage. So this one, I'm going to write B on the bottom, because he's going to be our straight out of the blister victim. There's a B. And this one, I'm going to show an alternate cleaning method with. Apologies for the crinkliness, unless you're into ASMR, in which case, you're welcome for the crinkliness. Okay, so this is uh, just a big dish of isopropyl alcohol. So I'm just dipping it in there. And we're going to get to why I did this as a cleaning preparation a bit later, but I needed to do that now because it's going to take it a few minutes to evaporate. So this is 91% isopropyl alcohol. All right. So that's what the snakes are for. Let's see where we are now. Let's talk about mold lines, everyone's favorite. of the universe. So there's going to be more crinkly plastic. I apologize for that. I organized up the, the different topics by um, putting things in these plastic bags so that I would be able to keep track of things. Okay, so these uh, penguins are bones black and this giantess is the original formula. Just so that we have a little bit of both to test on. So uh, first a disclaimer, I am not telling you to use knives, Reaper Miniatures is not telling you to use knives. I'm sharing a thing that I do and you can choose whether or not you feel it is safe for you to do. If you are a young person, you definitely need to consult your adult guardian before you do any of this stuff. So disclaimers aside, um, I tried to find miniatures with decent mold lines, but it may still be hard to see you know, in the camera situation. And unfortunately, all of the original recipe miniatures I had are the white ones. So I'm not sure if you can see that, let me try taking this light off for a minute, that there's a, a mold line down here along her shin. So what I would do is, it's kind of like um, paring a carrot. What I want to do is just catch the knife under that line well, just, just in case we have any really new people, mold lines are a little ridge. If you think about an Easter bunny, how there's a little ridge around your Easter bunny because it's two halves of chocolate that are put together, that's kind of how the, the mold of a miniature works. So there are two halves together, and then they inject the material, whether it's metal or plastic or whatever, into that. And when you pull it apart, you get a little ridge line where the mold met, and that's a mold line. And you don't have to care about them. I mean, if you're, if you're painting on your game table and they don't bother you, no one says you have to remove them. This is information for people that you bother. So you kind of want to catch the, the knife just under the mold line. And then it's like you're peeling a carrot. So this is a standard um, size 11 X-Acto blade. You may even be able to see that on the camera. Uh, they, they work, but I find that they will get dull within two to three like normal person size miniatures. So the, something I found that works a bit better is a scalpel. Now a scalpel is literally intended to cut human flesh so keep that in mind when you make your choices about what to use. But what I think works about the scalpel is it's thinner so it seems to stay sharp longer and it, I really use it in just the same way. Just kind of try to catch that mold line. The thing about the original Bones plastic is it's so uh, rubbery that you can't scrape the way you would with a hard plastic or a resin miniature. What's nice about Bones Black is they're hard enough that you can do that. So let's see, we've got some mold lines down along the wing. 
in here, I think we might want the, yeah. So you see where there's that kind of ridge where I, when I move it, that's the mold line. So these are a little easier to prep because you can just scrape along that and you're scraping off the material until it lies flat with the surface of the miniature. So that's one of the really nice things about Bones Black is that you can prep them like resin. Um, yeah, Rhonda isn't allowed to use knives. <laughs> Rhonda isn't allowed to use glue too and you're going to get to watch that later. Uh, these kinds of files I do not recommend using. So this is the kind you could get at the hardware store with like crisscross etching. This is very likely going to damage the material and leave um, kind of harsh marks that you're going to see when you paint. We're back on the white one, so I'll turn that off. So I don't recommend this kind of file. If you have a fine diamond file, however, those work well. The trick is, if you're used to filing metal miniatures, we're going in there and we're kind of sawing back and forth. You need to use a much, much softer hand. Um, and we'll keep going on the legs since I messed it up in that other place. So what also helps, I find, is to go just in one direction. So I'm just using, like, I can, I can feel it, but you can see it's not even pressing down the skin of my, my finger. When I'm talking about a light touch, that's what I mean. Like, you could do this on a baby, and it's not going to bother them. And people find this a creepy metaphor, but that's, I'm trying to emphasize it's, you're, not, you're not in your wood shop. This is a light, gentle motion. So you do that, and then if you've got kind of little griblies, just even more lightly go in the opposite direction. It can be hard to find uh, good diamond files, particularly if you don't get to look at them in person, if you don't have the kind of store where you can do that. Uh, what I recommend is searching for two millimeter diameter files. That should get you something about this size that is appropriate for miniatures. Uh, some years back, I ordered a bunch of cheap files that, that were made in China, and I got some that were about this size. I got some that were, like, incredibly tiny, which occasionally is handy for getting into those, like, little tiny armpits. Uh, and then I got a few that were too large, but they were great on metal. So they all ended up being usable. It was just a question of what I can use them for. These are the three most useful shapes. I have this whole thing. This is actually from Rio Grande, which is... a jewelry company reaper used to get some of their products into the physical store so i got this like i don't know 15 years ago from the physical store uh, but you can order from them through a catalog i think but so the most common ones that you'll see are the half round which is it's got like a, a slightly rounded surface here and a flat surface there that is super useful this is a round i don't use it as much but there's a few things that it's just the perfect answer for um, <laughs> I, you guys are talking about the baby things, right? I'm, I'm not even going to look at this part. This one is a crossing file is, is the name of it. And what it is, it's kind of like two half rounds stuck together. So there's a bit of an edge. And that works really well for getting in between fingers. I use these on metal miniatures too. So it works really well for getting in between fingers. If you have the kind of hair strands, I know she's got hair doodads that are going to get in the way, but... You kind of get in between there. So first you file off the top, and then you go in with that side if you need, if you can see a mold line kind of in the ridges. But there's one additional option. Um, if, you, if you have diamond files and you tried them on bones, and like first go back and try them with a really gentle hand. But if you do that and you still don't like the results, these things are called sanding needles. There's also ones called sanding sticks. Um, I think they tend to be more flexible material. So these are round and it's a fairly solid plastic and then it tapers down to a point. And it's kind of like a, a hobby emery board. So it's a nice light sanding grit. I think in the, in the picture in your book, it was a pack with three different ones. I think the blue is medium, the white is fine, and the gray is the roughest. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I most typically use the blue. I haven't used the gray at all. But uh, the blue and the white, I don't see a huge difference. And it's a similar thing. I would probably file, or 
sand in one direction with a pretty light hand, and then if there's any like little bits hanging off, just go back and clean it off. And sometimes even if it looks a little bit rough, like get a coat of paint on there and make sure that it's not just a visual thing. And it should also work on these guys too, I would think. I do usually scrape these, but you'll get like weird little sections where it's hard to get a knife in there. And see there, this is one of those places where, and I get this on metal miniatures too, it looks like there's a mold line there, but there's probably not as much of a one as it looks because I've been filing on it. So hopefully that addresses concerns about uh, mold lines. They are called diamond files because they are made of diamonds, I think. They're industrial diamonds. Little tiny diamonds aren't worth anything. And Russia and Canada are full of them. I also like Yafina, actually. It looks like she's talking to someone who's making very poor life choices. And I am amused by that. What are the names of these things again? So this is in the handout you can get, and there's a brand name, which I think is Alpha Abrasives. But I'm pretty sure there's a couple other brands, and they're called Sanding Needles. If you search for Sanding Sticks, because I always forget and call Sanding Sticks, uh, you'll find different things. It's more like literally hobby emery boards. Um, but the, the hard plastic, I think, makes these work better. I have seen them in Hobby, hobby Lobby. I would also check Hobby Town and see if you can find them there, especially if you're not super pro Hobby Lobby. Um, so that was filing and scalpel blades. Oh, so the scalpels, I did forget to mention, this is a standard X-Acto handle. If you buy scalpel handles, they're like this cheap flimsy plastic. They're pretty short, too, because they're intended to be one-use uh, tools if you're using them for cutting up people because there's, now there's germs on them. So, But they fit fine just in a standard hobby knife handle, so that's where I put them. I'm reading those out because they're going to be relevant later. That was mold lines. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about glue. And assembly and whatnot. So I don't know if we've been watching, but uh, some months ago I was putting together a bunch of uh, bones and he got like a really annoyed text message for me about how, <laughs> how annoying it was to put together a bunch of bones. And he's like, well, what glue are you using? And I was using gel glue from Hobby Town, which is what I've used for years. And he's like, well, we all like this. So this is Loctite uh, Super Glue Ultra Gel. I think that part's important. And I got some from Amazon, and this is actually my second bottle, because I liked it so much I put together all those bones, and I'm like, well, I better buy a fresh bottle to make sure that some will actually come out when I assemble the, the remainders on this stream. And then the other thing I'm going to do for a different exercise is take this little guy and glue him to the base. So when I tested glues, and I didn't actually even use this. I was testing with my Hobby Town glue years and years ago. Um, I tested, I think I tested Carpenter's glue or, you know, like the Elmer's school glue type style stuff, but the hardware version. So when I use glue, I actually like to dispense it out into something. That's one reason I keep these blisters. And then use a toothpick to apply it. Especially, I mean, this is a fairly large part, but if you're working just with a little arm or something, it's it's a lot easier to avoid getting excess glue where you don't want it if you don't use the applicator on the bottle and you instead use a toothpick. So we're just going to stick that guy's head on. And then in a few minutes, I will try pulling it apart. And we'll see what happens. And this one, be, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, you can see this on the camera. It's not quite flush. The middle part isn't quite flush. I need to make sure I get the glue on the edges if I want it to stick to the base because there's like a little ridge. And I know this because I did the exact same thing on Thursday and it didn't work initially and I had to figure that out. So we'll stick him on the base. So these Reaper bases um, are kind of nifty. And there's a variety of different sizes because they're hollow on the middle. 
So when you get these miniatures uh, with the bases built in, and he's, he's too big to go in, but you get the idea, um, you can put them in that side and just fill up around the sides if you want it to be exactly flush. I decided to put this guy on the top because the material I'm going to demonstrate with you, I think you'll be able to see it better than if there's if it's in a recessed area. But they're they're neat because they give you the flexibility to put the figure, you know, if you're just painting the feet and you've made your own terrain, or if you've, you've got the built-in integral base, you can drop it into the base. Let me get him back out in a minute. So it's been a few seconds or a minute or two, and already that's nice and stuck. This guy's going to take a little while longer, I think, because of the flat base. But I will uh, finish telling you about my glue experiments, because this is one of the areas where people always have a lot of questions. My preferred glue for assembling metal miniatures is to use uh, two-part epoxy five-minute glue. So you have to mix the two parts together, and then you have to hold the thing together for five minutes. And it's a, it's a nice, durable bond. Um, it did not test well with the bones. It did all right, but it didn't do anywhere near a super glue. So when Reaper tells you that super glue is the best glue, they're not lying. It was also the best glue for gluing together two different surfaces. So one of my tests was, in fact, I think my main test was, gluing them to plastic bases, metal bases, and unfinished wood bases and MDF bases, I think. Um, so the first thing I did was I, I glued them, I let it sit a while, and then I tried what I just did now. Could I just pull it apart with my fingers? And some of them I actually could. And anything that survived that, all of the pieces got put into one of these, a little plastic uh, pencil case with no padding or anything and I put the extra bases and stuff in there and I wrapped it in a towel and I put it in the dryer for like 10 or 15 minutes to simulate um, the stresses of life. And the the super glue bonded ones were the ones that passed those tests the best. The one that the one material it didn't work with that eventually it came off even in the dryer was gluing to raw wood. And I think that's because it's raw wood and it soaks up so much of the glue that it's not enough to form an, uh, the adhesive bond. So what I would suggest if you want to drew, glue some bones to raw wood, which you know you can get um, like those little circles at the hobby store, fairly cheap for bases, or maybe you want to do like a plinth and, and custom stain it and stuff, is to use a pin. So I can't get into the whole deal with pinning. This is another one of those things. You can talk to people on forums or on Facebook or whatever but this is a pin vise. You get a little drill bit. I mean, the bones material is like super easy to to go through. You make a hole, and you make a hole in the corresponding, you know, in your wood surface. Then you use something like a paper clip in your hole, and that gives your glue something additional to adhere to. Definitely do this with with metal miniatures. I I don't think it, you know, for putting this guy's head on something like that isn't necessary. Or bones, but if you're gluing a bones to a non-plastic surface, this will help you guarantee that you get a, a sturdier bond. Um, I did not hang a finger under a metal girder and see if he just hung from it because their bones are so light. That's why this. <laughs> that's why they don't get damaged. Um, so yeah, the glue tests I, I was talking about are one of the things that are in the the booklet. So if you came late, you're going to be able to go here and, and download a PDF that's going to give you all the products and, and the general techniques that I'm talking about. This video is also going to be available for you to watch again on Reaper's uh, Twitch channel here. And then after a week or so, they post things up on their YouTube channel. So don't worry if you missed the beginning, you're fine. So we'll just get rid of him for now. I think I need the glue. Let's talk about conversion. Actually, I do need the glue because we're going to talk about conversion next, I think. The desk is a cutting surface, I know, but it's new still, so I don't want to mess up my next cutting surface. Okay, so one of the fun things about bones, and this is if you get a chance to come to in-person ReaperCon, like you definitely want to do this, is um, they do a... I can't remember what they call it. Someone will say in chat. Do like a bones conversion class. And my video froze again. Just one minute. Let 
this fixing the document camera hopefully oh why don't why aren't you back I'm sorry what was that Justin yeah the document camera seems to have died but it's not it I can see it's display but it's not showing up on yeah let me try switching scenes yeah that's just a big black screen now hmm okay can you um well can people still hear me if people can still hear me i am attempting to solve a technical problem uh and let's see what happens so far it looks like nothing happened should i try turning it on and off okay so i'm turning my uh the close-up camera is a little uh fiddly so for some reason it has decided to stop transmitting to my twitch stream and now it's booting up so it's a moment of suspense will we find out if we can get it to uh work again Still booting. <laughs> All of this stuff seems like it takes a thousand years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can do what with it? <laughs> I would probably give it to a teacher who would need it. All right, let's, because um, it's back on and I'm not seeing anything. There we go. Excellent. Okay. So, as I was saying, if you and and we may uh if we have enough video problems, I may try to do just a straight through video where I run through the the spiel and Reaper can post it sometime. Uh or next time I get to visit Reaper, you know, and whenever that's a safe thing to do again. Anyway, let's not dwell on that. Uh, so one of the fun things you can do at real in-person ReaperCon is go to a class where they have like a literal giant tub, like one of those 20 liter or whatever tubs, full of bones. And they give you knives and glue and you just go nuts and you cut things up and you make your own incredible, creative, awesome creations. Um, this is going to be like a very limited example of that. So this white bones, it I don't, that actually seemed like it was, more difficult than it should have been most of the time it just cuts like butter it's just and as as we learned previously in the chat i'm an idiot about knives so if i can do it uh and then these because i just wanted to make sure that you can do it with the bones black too it's a little tougher but you can get through there eventually now what's going to happen is i'm going to attempt to stick this together and my glue curse is going to activate and it's not going to stick but just trust me when I say that this glue is good and this premise is good and I just have Michael Proctor, if he's still in chat, will confirm that I have on several occasions asked him to glue things because I just can't even with glue. Um, but that's how easy that is. And that's when I was talking about how if you want to reshape something, that's what you have to do. You need to cut his arm off and move it into more of an upward position. And now I made this, whatever this guy is, more of a mutant. That was something I forgot to mention in the, in the beginning. Uh, I hope none of you were in there asking what miniatures these are, because I don't know. You're going to have to ask each other that. Um, when we get asked to paint them, they usually don't have names and numbers yet. Or I forget, or I just got like, you know, this guy's probably from my original. Oh, we're not very much in focus. This guy's probably from my original um, vampire box. Is that better? No, it's not better. And, yeah, so that's the other problem with this camera that we all love, is that it resets everything if you have to turn it on and off. It's just the best of. So now I'm having to go through a menu of, like, six different things and click them off. Okay, hopefully we have returned to not horrible video quality. So that's how easy conversion is. You can go nuts with that. 
So if, and if you have pieces like you don't love the steampunk ones or whatever, that's a nice thing to practice with. For that, you'll notice I use the hobby knife, not the, the scalpel. The scalpel is thinner, so it's not going to work as well for cutting things. That's, it's great for mold lines, but it's not as good for the cutting things. And I did mean to show these things. So these are track clippers, flush cutters. There's a variety of names for them. This particular brand is Euron, and I really do recommend it. Um, I have weak hands, and I can do this on metal stuff, no problem. It's not as great for doing this as a knife if you can use a knife because you'll notice this end kind of got pinched together so it does cut flush but it cuts flush on one side so if I wanted to use both parts of this for my conversion I'd, I'd have to then go back and cut this part flush and lose part of it but you can you can cut um, if you don't like integral bases you can cut them off of metal miniatures usually with these even like even with my sad weak hands I can do it so that, that tool is not mentioned in the handout, I don't think, and this tool is not mentioned in the handout. Those were things that came up in the discussion in the previous class. They weren't sort of directly bones related. So that was conversion. Now let's talk about gap filling. So you've got your mold lines off, you glued your guy together. What if there are unattractive gaps? Just one stone lurker. It was, it was a, all the tentacles came off one guy. And I figured his body would still make a fun monster just on its own. So if you look at here, there's an unattractive gap. If you look over here, you don't see it as much. And that's because in my Thursday class, I was showing off this material that we're going to talk about right now. Uh, so the easiest way to fill this kind of gap is um, this material. Let me find. And these, these products are in your gut. So this is so big, I'm going to actually hold it up here before I put it down under here. This is something called flex Flexible Modeling Paste by the company Liquitex, which is an acrylic paint manufacturer. Uh, the Golden is another art store acrylic paint manufacturer, and they call theirs Molding Paste. You may also be familiar with uh, Viejo Plastic Putty or a product from Games Workshop called uh, Liquid Green Stuff. I'm pretty sure they're all the same thing. And it's largely, and there's probably some fillers in there, but it's largely the stuff that makes acrylic tube paints really thick. Um, so depending on how much you need, and I'm going to show you a couple of different things you can do with this, this is going to be cheaper to just run out and buy this bottle. It's going to be about the same price as a bottle of paint and the same as the Games Workshop product. But this is way cheaper per ounce. So if you had friends that you wanted that also hob do the same hobby, it's going to be more cost effective for you to go buy a big tub of this stuff and split it up. But if you're hardly ever going to use it, you may find it more effective to just go a small one. I'm not showing you the green stuff as an example. I did buy some once years ago, and it dried out because their paint pots are a little non-optimal. So I might not recommend them because of that. So you can use standard sculpting tools with this product. Um, there's a metal one. I have another one here. And you can also use the, the silicone tools. But since it's usually tiny gaps, I'd either use like the, the dental pick style one, or I most often just use toothpicks. So you get in there. You see it's kind of like frosting. It's really easy to make ridges with it. And ideally, I should dispense this to a little uh, plastic, you know, a little blister pack or a plate or something, because eventually the air contact is going to dry it out. And you just kind of, so I'm going to be a little bit sloppy. Don't panic, because there's a, another cool feature of this stuff. Okay, that was maybe a little sloppier than I intended. You figure out how to work with it after a while. So I might use one toothpick to apply it and then a different toothpick to move it around. And you get it in that ridge, scrape off some of the stuff you don't need. But then the nice part about this stuff is that it's water soluble. I would try to use a, like a less great brush for this, but as long as you get it off, it's not gonna injure it. Like I said, it's kind of like uh, paint. But now I can very easily smooth this down 
get rid of the material, you know, that's covering up the texture on his arm here. I mean, I really did put an excess amount on there. But because it's like acrylic paint in that it's water soluble when it's wet, it's really easy to use. So you can see now it looks pretty much like the, the stuff from the other day. And this will be ready to paint before we're done talking today. Uh, such a small amount as that might be ready within about 10 minutes. Uh, this stuff is called flexible modeling paste. Uh, Viejo calls their version of it plastic putty. And Games Workshop makes something similar called liquid green stuff. If you, so like I was saying, it's, it's water soluble while it's wet. So if you did have it on your tool, you want to rinse your tool off and scrape all that stuff off before you let it dry. It becomes harder to get rid of. It dries, this stuff dries a little flexible, hence the name. Um, I think one of gold, like Liquitex may even have one that, that dries firm. Because bones are a little bendy, I think the flexible one is a good choice with them. I don't think it makes a huge difference. But actually, I'm not sure why I closed that up, because we can do some other cool stuff with this. Put him inside. So this is why I made this little base guy. Now imagine that I had put him on the recessed area. But I can use this to just make texture around there. You can get texture paste too, and, and you can get them from the art store as well as companies like Viejo. Um, so there's a sand one is a very useful one to have because you can make it look like dirt or you can make it look like desert sand or a beach for all our pirates that we, we just got. Works for all kinds of things. So that's a quick way to deal with uh, integral bases if you prefer to have a uniform size of base for your figures. So you can, if you, oh gosh, I froze again, didn't I? All right, let's try this again. Dun, dun, dun. Apologies. There we go. So um, I'm not sure where this froze. If they may have this modeling place at Michael's. If they don't, you would probably be able to order it online. Um, they'll de if you have a fine art store, they'll definitely have it, and they'll have like about a million different kinds of um, paste and mediums and stuff. So that's where you would get, there's one with pumice stone, there's one with sand. Um, what do you mean what size I'm, what size I'm using? Oh, for the drill bit, this is, this is actually the GW standard one. Um, it matched my paper clips that I had. Paper clips are actually a terrible thing to use in some respects because I cut I have two sets of these Euron shears because I used to cut paper clips with them and the steel paper clips actually chew this up. So now this is my nice pair for doing non-paper clip things and then I have the paper clip ones. So if you can get copper wire or copper paper clips, you can use whatever you want for pinning. And again, this is a question, this is kind of beyond the scope of the bones, so I'm actually going to stop talking about this. But you can go on the Reaper forums. You can go on any any place where miniature enthusiasts like to gather. Ask them for more information about pinning, and there will be lots of people who help you out. I'm talking over to the chat screen, but like because that's how that works. Okay, so I don't know if you can see from the side here that I'm making like it really is like frosting. I'm making peaks. So you can use that to make stuff like fire or waves. I try doing it from the side way a little more, but. Since I'm making ground on this little cobalt guy, if I don't like that, I can smooth that down a bit with a damp brush and give it sort of peaks and valleys. It's not sculpting, really, um, in the sense that if, if this gap were bigger or I was doing a conversion and I needed to create scale texture or fur texture or something, this stuff isn't a great answer for that. So if you want to do that, what do you use? And let me just clear these guys away and definitely put a lid on that before I spill it all over the place. Well, I'll keep him out for demonstration purposes. I'm not actually going to um, put some putty together and use it at this point. Uh, it's going to take too long. 
and it's a bit out of the scope of what we're doing. But at this point, you do need to use sculpting putty and tools. So epoxy putties are two-part putties. They're inert until you combine equal parts of, of each A and B, and you mush them together. Then they're like very soft when you first mix them, and it begins to chemically cure. And you have up to two hours working time. More practically, it's probably an hour, hour and a half. They cure faster when it's warm, slower when it's cold. Uh, and again, this is like a whole class or more on its own. But these are the materials that prior to when everybody was sculpting on computers, these were the kind of materials that people used to actually make the original master figure that gets turned into this guy. Uh, and some of the sculptors, I believe Bob and Julie may be in the chat, some of the sculptors still use this. So green stuff uh, by Needite is the, the classic material that is used for making miniatures. It is the best for taking detail. Uh, it's a little bit rubbery, it's good for organic surfaces. In the same family is a putty called Procreate. And th this material is in the, the thing you can download. I'll put this up while I'm talking. So for those who just got here late, you can go here and get a PDF and, and get information on the stuff I already talked about. Plus this video is gonna be available on demand later on the Twitch channel and YouTube channel. So uh, these two part putties, that family of putty is great if you kind of want to scratch sculpt or you're really doing fine detail work. Epoxy Sculpt, Milliput, and a brand called Magisculpt, and probably some other ones as well, are slightly different. They dry, they cure hard. Um, they're not as sticky when you're working with them and they're slightly water soluble. So it's not quite as easy to do as when I was using this plastic putty stuff, the molding paste to fill the gap. But it's a similar thing where you can use water and a brush or water in your tool and smooth out the joins and not get little ridges that you think you smooth, but you didn't actually, which is what often happens with me when I use green stuff. So for making bases, because you can do that same thing that I did with him, I could also use this putty and be able to, he's got like, I don't know if you can quite see, he's got like little cobblestones on his base. If I actually wanted to match that texture, I would use this putty and then use a tool and etch in, oh, I'd use a slightly smaller tool, etch in stones to try to duplicate this texture that the sculptor had done. And this is where these um, silicone tools come in really handy as well. These products, you can also uh, cut and sand and um, carve them more easily after they're cured than you can with the rubbery ones like Green Stuff and Procreate. As with the uh, modeling paste, you want to get that off of your tools before it dries, or it's a lot harder to get off. So hopefully that covers um, that. Oh, one thing I didn't mention with both these, it's relevant to the glues and these putties, there's a shelf life on this stuff. Super glue, uh, I have found to my detriment, it only lasts about two years. The epoxy glue only lasts about two years. These, If you're not doing fine, the cure time is about the same. You get about an hour and a half, two hours work time. Full cure for most putties is about four hours. And then it's really all the way done cure is 24 hours. But you, you can paint them at the point where they're not soft enough that just touching them with bristles would add texture. You can paint over them because they don't shrink. And, and many of us have done this with competition entries where it's like, oh, I got to get painting now. Um, but they're... The, the chemical products do go bad eventually. So um, you can keep your putty a little longer in the fridge and you can keep it longer by keeping it separate like this. If you need just a little bit of this stuff, uh, Reaper sells strips of green stuff, but you may want to, uh, it's attached together where the, the yellow and the blue are touching in the middle. It's starting to cure there in the middle. So if you cut those two pieces apart and put them in separate little baggies, it'll help it keep longer. Yes, and I do. I store my green stuff and my Procreate in the freezer. This epoxy sculpt, I, my first batch I got from Gen Con and I used it for like eight years and it's definitely not as nice as, as the fresh stuff, but for just doing bases and stuff, it works fine. So we've talked about cutting, we talked about sculpting. So preparing to paint, cleaning. Uh, this is why I have my sample snakes. So for those who weren't here at the beginning, 
I have a snake that I, and the people in chat can confirm. I took this out of the blister. I wrote the B on it for blister, and then I didn't do anything with it. This is one I prepared earlier by cleaning with dish soap. I scrubbed it with dish soap and a uh, toothbrush. So he has S on it for soap. This guy got a dip in a Tupperware full of rubbing alcohol. In this case, 91% isopropyl alcohol. He does not have anything on him because Sharpies are alcohol pens. So if I've written something on him, it just would have come off anyway. Um, and the purpose of this is, uh, so you can paint bone straight out of the blister, but it is a slightly, um, well, there's two reasons to do this. So it, people experience problems with the, the paint beating up and, and kind of rolling off the surface sometimes. So we call it a hydrophobic material. It, it's allergic to water. It doesn't like water. Um, but there's another problem with this. So, so this Mr. Snake here that just came out of the blister, uh, maybe the guy who was packing the boxes full of these in China just had a nice greasy lunch, or maybe the person who unpacked them in Reaper and packed them in the blisters had a big greasy lunch, or maybe you had a big greasy lunch when you took him out of the blister and you're going, oh, he's so cool, and you're rubbing your finger oils all over him. The same thing with metal miniatures and resin miniatures. In fact, it is even more important to wash those. They uh, coat the mold with a talcum powder for metal miniatures and other stuff for resin miniatures. You want to get all the gunk and oils and everything off of this before you start putting paint on it. First, the paint will apply better, but it will also stick better long term in terms of your paint job is going to stay sturdy and not get scratches and, and make you sad. So those are uh, preparation things you can do. And then, did I not? Hold on. There's something I'm not sure I prepped that I thought I prepped. So I'm just going to grab one of my guys for class later. So this is a paint handle. If you can, stick your figure down to a paint handle. Uh, this is an old pro paint bottle. I've used. Uh, wooden spools, dice cubes, dowels. There's like a million different things. Pill bottles, uh, prescription bottles are excellent for this actually. A million different things you can use. But again, I'm going to be touching this instead of touching the figure, so I'm not getting finger oils on it. And the other benefit is it's really easy for me to turn it around and get different places. You get less hand fatigue. So I recommend sticking them down like that. If you're used to slotted bases or bases with a texture, you probably use um, poster putty for that. And that won't work well on the flat bottom bone base like this guy has. And I know that, well, see, so it, it poster putty will probably work on this base because there's texture under there. And I know I had a flat, there we go. But it's not going to work great on that. You, and you, can, you can use, like, just standard double-sided tape, but there's a slight curve under this. Or if I had this little cobalt, if, if the people were here, from the beginning, notice there was a ridge around the end. So what I like to use is 3M, and I'm sure there are other companies that make this. It's called mounting tape. And you can get it in different widths. This is like a huge pack because that's how much I use it, but you can get like just a small little thing. I've seen this in pharmacies as well as the hardware store, um, big box store. But it's double-sided, and it's got a little foam give. And you can even reuse this. Usually you can pop the bones off and pop another one on, and it's more than tough enough that I, if I had a heavy metal, if I had this in metal, and I, which I have painted in metal, and it was flat bottom, I would not have any qualms about turning it upside down. And the camera's frozen again, isn't it? Yep. Okay, fixing. Okay. It has not been on that long. I've had it on way longer than this. Sorry, Justin's talking to me again. You're only hearing half of a conversation, so I sound crazy. Okay, so I would be fine doing that with metal miniatures, too. This is... What? Oh, no, it's... You're trying to make me sound crazy again. Okay. So, if you can, attach things to a paint handle. My apologies for all the technical difficulties, people. All right, so now we're going to get into the big debate bones primer uh, don't do it <laughs> the end okay you can all go home no all right so 
um, spray primer or spray products in general because I believe this also applies to sealer. You will go on forums, Facebook, Discord, whatever, and someone's going to say, I use spray X and it works great. And, and multiple people may mention spray X and it works great. You can go on those same places and other people are going to say, I use spray X and my miniatures are all sticky and it never stopped being sticky. There's something in the accelerant, in the chemical makeup, I don't know what it is, but there's something in spray products that does not consistently play nice with bones. I think part of the reason why one person, and in fact, very recently I read something and said, well, I use this all the time, and then I prime some guys, and now they're sticky. Climate and weather conditions, I think, affect this a lot. It affects any primer anyway. Um, and a lot of primers are weird about not telling you the optimal conditions, but I use Dupacolor Standable Primer from the auto store for my metal miniatures, and it's very clear of this is the lowest temperature, this is the highest temperature, this is the most amount of humidity that should be in the air when you are using this product. And you're taking a risk of it not working optimally if you use it outside of those conditions. I think the bones plastic and the, the sprays together are just more sensitive to that. So someone saying something works great and they live in Arizona, someone in Florida is probably not going to have the same result. You also do not need it. In my durability tests, which again, you can go on the, the website at the Reaper forums and see the pictures and, and review for yourself which things had the most chips and dings and all of that on the paint job, the ones that were just Reaper paint to start with worked the best. Like they were the most, they experienced the least damage in my stress test, which I also put um, painted miniatures in the dryer loose in the in the plastic box to stress test the various preparation methods. Some of them I tested naturally by taking them to conventions and carrying them around in one of those boxes. But um, so that is the official line of Reaper. That my experience and testing confirms that if you choose to use a spray product okay, but I would test on miniatures that you don't like very well. So the problem is, like, let's say you you believe me that it's not going to help your paint job be sturdier. So so that's not, if that's the reason you're priming, you don't need to, to prime. But there are other reasons to prime. So what are some solutions to those things? So let's go through some of those. Um, okay, so also just a note that I tested most frequently with Reaper paints, and I really genuinely use Reaper paints most often. I suspect most acrylic paints will work about the same. I have heard the most issues of people that I've heard having are with Viejo model color, model color specifically, not the game color, not all Viejo products, just the model color specifically. But I've also heard of people having a lot of problems with rub off on those on metal miniatures that were primed. So I think it's just a more fragile paint. It's probably not the ideal paint to use if your main goal is painting gaming figures. So if your reason is to help the paint adhere, just don't use primer. If your reason for wanting to prime is you want to start a particular color, Army Painter makes like green and red and whatever color primers, and maybe you're painting 20 orcs. So if you could paint them green, then you've already saved some time because you got like 30% of the color they're going to be is already painted. Just use Reaper paint instead, or, or another acrylic paint. Um, you can apply paint with an airbrush, and you can even thin paint and apply it through an airbrush, and it'll apply just fine and be a, a nice, sturdy uh, coat. So if you really like priming for a particular reason, I would recommend that you get a cheap airbrush from like Harbor Freight or something. You can get canned air propellant. You don't have to buy uh, a compressor. Eventually, the cost of that would be the same as buying, you know, five or six or whatever cans of primer. It, it, depending on if you've bought, like, entire hundreds of bones figures, it, it may be worth your doing that. I brush prime a lot because um, I usually want to start gray or whatever. Well, I mean, I don't prime for bones figures. I when, when they were still white and I was using them for classes and they were hard to see, I'd just paint the whole thing gray to make it more even color, but I'd use a brush. So another reason people like to prime is the Zenithal Prime, and here I'm going to reference my picture. So this is, you paint the figure black, and then you use a spray can from a particular direction to apply white paint 
to get either it helps you just visualize where the highlights and shadows go or as a starting point because you can kind of use thin paint over that and then boom your figure's painted this version was done with a spray can um, and I just took my chances on that being a bones and this one I did with an airbrush and you can see with the airbrush the result is much smoother so this this style of technique works even better with an airbrush so if you like doing this it's worth it getting an airbrush to do it with you don't get that speckly look that you get with the spray can uh, slightly different but similar thing is you like to do you like to prime white but you like to do a black wash over it and I feel like I had a better yeah I had a better guy to demonstrate this one so what what's happening there is people like the you know white primer because it's good for working under bright colors but they want to get something darker in the crevices or they just can't really see very well on when something's bright white so they like to apply so what I'm going to do is mix up two different um, washes to wash directly over the bones and I'm going to mix a whole bunch because for video purposes it's better to have more than less okay so this one I'm just going to mix with water and we're going to find out how hydrophobia works and then this one I'm going to use Reaper's brush on sealer and I'm going to talk about alternate products you can do this with um, as well Ah, and here so if you if you didn't order one of the swag boxes that has this guy in it Reaper sells them periodically but you can also get tea pins hat pins paper clips never squeeze your bottles always do something like that because you you can hear some stories so this looks like it's thick paint because essentially what brush on sealer and the other products I'm going to talk to you about are is the binder it's the clear part of paint and then they put different colors in it to make the different pigments in it to make the colors but these are both washes they're both more transparent than this paint that came out of the bottle somewhere that I've now lost but we'll find that in a minute um, but now I'm going to test out using these on this here so this is great if you have um, some of the skeletons that are in the white you don't even need to paint them you just put a wash on so this is the one that's made with the, the reaper brush on sealer and you can see that it's not beating up and rolling away at all and I could make that more transparent if I could have put more sealer in there if I want to now let's try the one that's just water now this figure has been washed it's actually probably been dipped in alcohol even so when I did this test it actually worked all right so there is a possibility that it is not going to reject the the paint in the way you would expect for such heavily thin paint and it didn't but here's how we're going to get it to here's how we're going to show you what hydrophobia looks like so we've got the base and it's not doing it because things never work the way you want them to on camera um who didn't I wash? I wash well I didn't wash these guys so let's see if I can get Mr. Blister to show us hydrophobia yeah so you see how that it started it, this is a big wide brush but the paint is going into a tiny thin line so let's try the soap and water one and it's not doing it and this is the one that went in the rubbing alcohol it's actually doing a little more um, there is some variation in the plastic mix there's a certain amount of uh, so you can see that it's beating off of the surface but now let's try the one that was mixed with the brush on sealer and it's not doing that so you can apply thin down more transparent paint directly to the surface of bones you just have to use something other than water to thin it down and I'm going to mention a few alternatives so I it works so well on the bottom of these I don't know if I even need to finish. yeah so you can see how hydrophobic that is this is the one straight out of the blister this is applying the paint thin down with the brush on sealer 
the brush on sealer we're going to brush on sealer is very sim similar to paint it's not going to obscure details if you apply several coats you can get it to obscure details um, do I normally use the same ratio of paint to sealer with making a wash that way if I'm doing the wash on uh, a surface that's already been painted, if there was already an initial coat of paint on there. So once you get a coat of paint on bones, you can thin your paint down for glazes, you can thin them down for washes, you can use every single technique that you would normally use. Um, it's just that first coat on the surface that's going to experience this hydrophobia uh, thing. So if I were doing it at a later step, I might do half sealer and half water, uh, or I might not. If, if one of the things you don't like about doing glazes and layers is this, is how watery the paint is, and it makes it harder to control, brush on sealer works great for solving that problem too. So typically, if I were doing it on an already painted surface, I would do half brush on sealer, half water. Uh, if I want to go directly on the bones, I'm going to go all brush on sealer, maybe three drops brush on sealer, one drop water, and see if that works. But uh, let's talk about the other products real quick. So the, in my testing, the brush on sealer worked really well. This was probably my second favorite was uh, Folk Art Glass and Tile Medium. And you should be able to easily find that, possibly even in Walmart, but definitely in Michael's or Joanne type craft stores. This is uh, Liquitex Matte Medium. This is Liquitex Glazing Medium. Golden uh, has very similar products. The thing about buying the art store ones is they make literally like 188 different mediums and additives and stuff like that. So check stuff like this. They'll usually give you some indications. So this indicates that it's more on the fluid side than the thick side. If you start getting over here in the thick side, that's like that paste that we were showing. That is going to fill in detail. That is the point of it is to create texture and stuff. So you want to be more on the fluid side and you want to be on the transparent side. And you can even use brush on sealer literally as a primer. Like you could just do a transparent coat of that over your figure and then start using paint. So that's one of the things that people start worrying about the, the covering up detail. Um, and I find that a little odd because it, it's paint. Like you put paint on a miniature. And I know, so for years we told people to thin paint so I think that's where it's coming from and paint does come in different consistencies but a reaper paint out of the bottle is usually pretty much the ideal consistency for base coat if you maintain it I mean events transpire and it does lose uh, water and become thicker so you need to check your paints now and then but um, basically what you want in applying initial coats is you just don't want to be adding texture or filling in texture. So this is my test for that. Um, the mediums are very good for thinning metallics, though, if you want to thin them, because uh, the metal flake stays in suspension more. So this is Reaper Paint Leather Brown. The others are uh, various Liquitex paints that I've got. I, well, I bought this one, but the other ones I got at demos at my art store. So my test for is a paint going to fill in my texture or cause problems? Is it the right consistency for a base coat? Imagine my brush is a boat and it goes through the water and it leaves a wake. You want that little wake to fill in as quickly as possible. So you can't even really see the path of the brush on this brown one, right? You can already see that it's a much different story here on the, I think this is Liquitex soft body. So it's fairly close to miniature consistency, but that ridge is staying there. I would still need to thin this down if I were going to apply it directly to the surface of the miniature. These are heavy body paints. It's, it's like that um, molding paste that we were looking at earlier. I can literally make peaks and valleys with it. That's great if you're painting a canvas painting. And there are applications, this is why I have the tube of white, there are applications for it in miniatures, but not for applying your, your basic coat to it. So you can see those sideways even. That's going to add texture to your miniature. This runny paint that's floating around the blister now is the same thing as this brush on sealer. It's not going to add 
significant texture your miniature. If you do coat after coat, if you pile it up in a little hill, yeah, you can eventually add texture or remove texture with it. But you, this is no different than a spray of primer. Like that's adding a few microns to the surface, adding a coat of paint or brush on sealer, just adding a few microns to the surface. It's not a significant difference in terms of losing your texture. And I know we, we did yell at you guys for years to thin your paint, thin your paint, but paints were being sold more at this consistency. And, and some, there are still some brands of miniature paint that are closer to this, and you may need to thin down a little with water before you apply them to, to any miniature. But um, if you're using Reaper paints or paints that are about this consistency, you should not be worried about filling in your details. So hopefully that allays that concern. Uh, I would use the brush on sealer to thin metallics. I would use it over using uh, water, in fact, because the the little flakes, the little metal flakes, are actually heavier than most pigment colors. So they, it falls out of suspension really easily if you start mixing water in. All right, let me... So yes, you can use airbrush, and you can thin the airbrush with water. I like to put a little bit of airbrush medium into my paint mix for any purpose, just because it keeps my brush from clogging up as much. Um, I know other painters use a mix of water with a little bit of the same isopropyl alcohol that I showed you earlier for cleaning. Uh, so I showed you the alternative uh, products to the brush on sealer. So stripping paint, eventually, Maybe you painted something and you liked it or you inherited some of these old figures. The product I use most often is called Simple Green. If you are in a country outside of the U.S., I think this is available in Canada too, do a search online for Simple Green Miniature Stripper and you should find a thread where people talk about what the active ingredient is. Um, I think I've heard Death Hall works from the U.K., Probably like pine based cleaners would work, but um, I would test. I would get a figure you don't like as much or some sprue or cut off a bit of a base or something. But um, I keep a tub kind of like the alcohol with my simple green in it and just reuse it. Eventually it will stop being green for some reason I don't understand, but it usually still works to take off the paint. The thing about simple green is it's not super fast. Like you usually have to soak it at least a day and then you get a toothbrush and you scrub. And you can see that there's some coloration left behind. Um, I also did use, when I uh, cleaned this guy, when it was fresh out of the stuff and everything was uh, like a little rubbery, I used this to pick out of a few details. You can also scrub and then just throw it back in the cleaner and give it another day or two and then scrub again. It depends on how impatient you are to get the job done. What I like about Simple Green is that it's non-caustic. So it's not going to hurt me or the miniatures. Uh, I've heard of people using a range of caustic products on metal miniatures, brake fluid, all kinds of stuff. All of that I would test before using on a plastic figure. It's a whole other ball game for being a different material. The Simple Green works for me. I'm not impatient, um, so I don't have other recommendations to make on that front. Don't worry about the discoloration. That's effectively some pigments are almost dyes, and that's what's happening with this brush too. It's blue because whatever paint I used probably had say a little blue in it, um, and it just it's a dye. It never comes out. It especially never comes out of your carpet. Just just a, just a tip not to spill blue paint on your carpet. Um, so sealer is a similar thing. Uh, I don't want to spray primer on my bones. I don't want to spray sealer on my bones. You can use this brush on sealer or other um, brush on sealer products through your airbrush. Honestly, I don't seal my bones. They're so light um, that I think if I take all of the other steps, if I take care of all the other steps, I wash the figure, I used a painting handle, um, I didn't, you know, overly thin my first layers of paint, I think that makes the paint sturdy enough that I don't need to seal. So hopefully Ron Hawkins is not watching out because I usually don't seal my metal miniatures either. Uh, I do seal my metal miniatures that I use for gameplay. Um, what, I, what is more important than sealing, in my opinion, is how you store and, and travel with your figures. So this is not the recommended method. 
throwing them all in the bag that you throw in your backpack or your game bag or whatever is not the method I would recommend. There's going to be sharp edges on some of these figures that are going to collide against others of these figures and scratch the paint off. Um, I had a friend who did store her miniatures this way, and and she had some of the beds, and you can see the damage. And you can see it's happened on this guy, where there's been some rub off in various places. So this is kind of just one that I'm saving for experiments or, or to give away to people or something. But I thought it would just be a nice demonstration of, of how not to do. Um, this is from, if, I think it was Kickstarter 1 or Kickstarter 2. They had some plastic uh, carrying cases, and they had these foam square things in them. These work, but you do have to be aware of a few caveats. Well, let's put them these up. So see, even more bones in the paint. And this one's even a pirate. So you see how he just stuck a little when I pulled them out? That can make the paint come off a little. But a bigger problem is these, these figures, and particularly these uh, Surfor scales, are, they don't fit in the cube. And you can see exactly where Surfor scale doesn't fit in the cube is exactly where the paint is coming off. Because this has flexed back and forth and back and forth every time it's been taken out and the lid's been closed and it pushes down on that. And that's what's damaging my paint. You can see the parts of him that do fit in his section are fine. So that's because that's a flex point and I haven't treated it correctly. There is a bottom section that has bigger squares in, and once I started noticing this problem and I kept the figures in the larger squares, I stopped having as many problems with it. So if you have, and so if you have a pluck foam tile, it's a similar thing. Make sure you pluck out a square that's large enough to fit the entire figure in, and you're not having it scrape against the sides when you're pulling it in and out. These figures were all gamed with. These are my gaming figures. They are not sealed. I will be fine if you do this all day long. I mean, it's not optimal to do it all day long, and I don't want to store them like this and have them shifting around against each other. But for gameplay, it's just like, oh, I killed the orc. That's not going to make the paint come off. There's actually three or four scales. I have the one that didn't have the paint flake off somewhere else that I keep to use in photographs to show scale. Um, this is not the thing I thought it was. Hold on. There we go. This is the new uh, figure carrying case that Reaper is selling. That's barely going to fit in here. So this is uh, the eggshell style foam, and I like this. I think this is going to work better. These figures are also all gaming figures that were not sealed and, and were used in our game. And I'm not going to say we game every five minutes, but again, I, I didn't care what people did with them. My metal figures, I sealed them in gloss, and then I put mask spray over them. But I didn't care what happened to these guys. So this method, I think, is going to be better because it's not going to flex them as much. They're not touching each other directly. You can do something similar to this with Tupperware containers or these um, plastic pencil cases. So what I would do in this case is I'd put down a layer of um, bubble wrap, put a layer of bones, another layer of bubble wrap, another layer of bones, or foam sheets. Basically, you just need to immobilize them so they're not rubbing a lot, and then the paint job should stay relatively, you know, it's going to stay safe. But I think that rubbing them back and forth in travel and, and, and um, storage has caused more damage that I've seen than using them in gameplay as intended. Uh, so wash them, try not to handle them while you're painting them. And actually one more tip, and this applies to glue. I forgot this under the glue section. So touch dry or handle dry and actually cured are two separate things, and we're not always conscious of that. So with super glue, you can touch it in minutes. If, uh, my apologies if you hear a sad whiny cat. Uh, so super glue, you can touch it in minutes. It doesn't fully cure for 24 hours. That's one of the other reasons I use two-part epoxy glue because it fully cures in an hour. So I can be confident when I'm handling and painting a metal miniature that where I pinned the arm on or whatever, that, that that's as good as that bond is going to get. Um, acrylic paint is touch dry in minutes. Oh, and the thing is frozen again. Uh, acrylic paint is touch dry in minutes, but it doesn't fully cure for a couple of days. So another way to make your miniature sturdier is um, to paint them as well before the event as you can. Now. It's not an ideal world, and sometimes we, we've got to paint the, the figure in five seconds and have the game. But if you can, paint your figure a couple of days before your event and let it sit for a minute without a lot of handling, and that will help the durability. Um, actually, instead of my face, let's go back to looking at the other miniatures, because some of you didn't see them then at the beginning. So, um, and then epoxy putty is a similar thing. It's touch pure within four hours, but it's not fully cured for 24 hours. So these were just some of the nicer bones that I pulled out. And this actually, one of the reasons I did this, I wanted you guys to see this. This is a paint stir stick 
um, you can get the slats from shutters or doors with shutters. These are great if you're doing batch painting. So you just put all your orcs on here and just go down the row, um, you know, face, 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 arm, 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 uh, for painting more quickly. So there, there are handle possibilities for batch painting as well as um, individual miniature painting. So I'm going to check and see if we have any questions that I might not have answered. So I would also say um, if you if you had questions like a half an hour ago that I didn't answer, please ask me now because I have not done a very good job of keeping up with Chad since I had to keep up with my camera. So just to review for people that weren't here before, these figures are both bones black. The little, at least I'm pretty sure that this guy's bones black. I know this guy's bones black. And then the rest of them are the regular. So yeah, he's much more standard. And this one was painted with airbrush. Uh, there's another figure or two that I painted with airbrush, but they're over at Reaper now. So I could not grab them for this demonstration. Um, so I don't think I see any. Yeah, I think tissue, like paper towels would work too. I just happen to have a lot of um, bubble wrap. Um, but I had to, so this is actually my new studio that you're seeing in the background. Um, we redid our floors last year. So I had to pack everything up, like all the shelf of shame and all the things I had to get packed up, not just the, the miniatures that I travel with. So let's see, do we have any goblins or teal? I would be down for that. Any advice on how to remove the bases from bone spot figures? They're really hard to cut. Um, I haven't done that a lot. I would probably try starting with the Zeron, shield, the Zeron shears. So these ones are called track cutters or flush cutters. Um, I'm sure people in the chat can recommend some other names to search for for what these are called. I like do like the Zeron brand specifically, but it is far from the only brand that you need to buy. Uh, they cut flush on one side and not on the other. So here, th um, these little penguins are bones black. And I cut metal with these. So, so I would probably um, get the bulk of the material off with this and then shave the rest off with a craft knife. So hopefully that helps with that. And by shave, um, we're going to like simulate this because Rondo isn't allowed to use knives as previously discussed. I would be doing something like that to shave off around exactly where the figure is. Um, so, no other questions? So, slice the, oh, here, slice this off. You can, um, that's, there, there would be two ways to do this. So, you can kind of get in there and start getting under it. Oh, and the timer's frozen, so you can't actually see me doing that. Let's see. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you can see that I'm kind of getting under to thin that out. You can also sand, since this is the bones black, um, it should sand better. It may even work with that file I said not to use on bones, because this is how I do it with metal ones. Yeah, I would I would uh, carve with the knife first, and then maybe just do that as a. So at this point, I would start taking the knife and start carving it down like that to get it flat. Yes, that is the easiest answer if you can just cut around it. Like if you, if you have a pre-made base that you're trying to stick the guy down on, then you have to go through all this bother. If I'm building up something around it like this and I just wanted to get rid of the most material possible because I want to sculpt my own um, cobblestones or something like that, I, it, having it under the feet doesn't matter that much because I'm going to build up around it. So it, it depends on what you're trying to do for the end thing. But this is the thing that is a pain in the butt with most materials other than original bones. Sad to report. Um, so I don't think I'm seeing any more questions. I'm really shocked because people seem to have so many questions about bones usually. So um, go forth and tell people not to prime. No, <laughs> but I do, I do see you guys having threads on, on Facebook or other places and I just I've had the discussion so often that I just can't anymore. <laughs> so I usually don't. I'm usually like, oh, this is like a religious debate at this point. I'm just going to keep scrolling and scrolling. Um, but I would say if, if you don't believe me, do your own test. Like it's, it's easy to do. And especially for the paint stuff, now you know how to get paint off of them. So this miniature, you know, I may, or the, the guy with the tentacles, I sacrificed for your benefit. But stuff that's just paint test, that, um, you just strip the, the primer that didn't work off and, and keep going. So, um, 
So um, let me reiterate where you can get this information. So you go here, right under the top bar, there's going to be a sentence that says, get your bones PDF here or something like that. Just click that link. Um, the rest of this site is full of tips about painting. I've got an article on how to check your paint and uh, make sure that it's the correct consistency and how to add water and uh, revive it if it's experiencing some of the problems that older paint can have. Um, I've got a lot of kind of moral support articles about how learning and how we as artists are often not very kind to ourselves. Uh, so there's other stuff there of interest for painters. Uh, you're welcome to poke around. There's an on painting here that links to a Reaper video. I've got a bunch of stuff about our old buddy contrast. Um, but if all you want is this, so this is what I've been cribbing from, and it has the links to the full threads on the Reaper forms. And that also, you will then be in the Bones forum if you go one up from, from this uh, link. And there was a place where there are hundreds, dozens of people have posted, so you can search the posts that already exist, or you can ask questions. And I'm there sometimes, but there are people that have painted way more bones than I ever have that can help answer your questions too. So this is what you're going to get if you go do the download, and it has the pictures of the product. There's the uh, mounting tape, which hopefully, I don't know if this brand is in all the other countries, but it's something you buy to hang pictures up and stuff, so hopefully you can find that fairly easily in different countries. And I know that uh, Golden and Liquitex, and there may be similar um, products for different brands that you can find in other countries, and, and the same thing with Super Blue. Um, I, I'm from Canada, and I live in the U.S. now, so I, I'm not aware of all of the things you can get, but hopefully you can get equivalents. And that's another thing to go on forums to talk to people about or, or on uh, the Facebook page or the Discord, anywhere people that like to do this hangout. They're, most of the people in our hobby are wonderfully helpful and are, are happy to share their experiences and, and help you solve your problems. So hopefully that um, helped, and now you know everything you ever need to know about bones. I don't know what we're going to next. Justin, what are we going to next? Oh, that's right. Uh, so, so there's going to be a we'll be back screen for a little while, and then uh, Mocha Mini is going to be doing a painting class on the Twitch, Twitch channel, where you can go to the uh, reaperconlive.com site and check the schedule and find out if there are some other classes or events that you'd like to participate in. But there's still Reapercon fun to be had, even tomorrow. There's still stuff tomorrow. So uh, it's ending, but it's not over. And it was uh, great to spend some time with all of you. So I'm going to switch you over to the other screen now. Bye. Have a good day.